Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we are going to continue on with my formerly regular but now occasional series on the evidence for evolution. This installment will be covering transitional species, but rather than hash out all the transitional fossil sequences that we've all heard a bunch of times, I thought I would take it in a different direction and point out some currently extant species that have traits that could place them in different categories, making them appear to span the gap between those categories. So let's go! Let's start off with an animal that, if you follow me on Twitter, you may have already heard me talking about. I might have gotten a little bit salty at the fact that this fish is an amazing example of a living transition, and has even been experimented on by scientists in order to learn about the evolutionary development of various tetrapod characteristics, but nobody seems to be talking about it. When bringing up living transitional organisms, the go-tos all seem to exclude these guys. So I had never heard of them when researching any of my videos. It wasn't until I started getting into fish keeping that they came up, and even then, it was just a cool monster looking fish that can keep an arowana company without getting eaten. They didn't go into just how cool these guys are from a scientific perspective. I'm talking, of course, about the Bashir. And yes, I am probably saying that wrong. And yes, I have looked up how to pronounce it. The problem is that everyone tells you a different pronunciation is the proper pronunciation. These guys are known by my kids as the monster dinosaur puppy fish, or just as Falcor when we're talking about the Senegal Bashir. So little rhino, what's the next fish that we're going to get? The monster dinosaur puppy fish named Falcor. This is a very basal species of ray fin fish, and are useful for studying early evolution of the tetrapods, as some of their key characteristics that make them a transitional species are likely derived from their common ancestor with the lobed fin fish, meaning that their characteristics are quite similar to what these characteristics would have looked like in the lineage that led to the tetrapods. So what are these characteristics that make them so evolutionarily important? For one, they have lungs. And not the modified swim bladder style lungs that have developed in several other fish species, or the labyrinth organ that is a modified pharyngeal arch, but real, honest to goodness lungs. This would have been very helpful in their natural habitat, which is in swampy waters with minimal current. So in the wild, they live in water that is very poorly aerated, which makes sense. Breathing directly from the atmosphere would help them survive there. To breathe, they have spiracles on top of their heads, which they prefer to use to respirate at the surface, though when they don't feel safe, they can use their mouths for a quick gulp of air. There are many other aquatic species that have similar spiracles, including sharks, but they usually use them to push water past their gills while their mouths are otherwise occupied. This fact, combined with the Bashir's tendency to breathe through its mouth when stressed, has led to debate about whether they even use their spiracles to breathe, but scientists have since shown that when the fish feels safe, it uses its spiracles for about 93% of its breaths, as opposed to 40% when it's stressed. Because their lungs are so similar to modern tetrapod lungs, in that they are similar in structure, they utilize recoil aspiration, and they're derived from a similar location on the embryo, they can provide us with a snapshot into the development of the first lung-type organs that would have eventually allowed tetrapods to move onto land. And this does answer the common question, what good is half a lung? Well, when it accounts for less than half of your respiratory needs, it turns out to be quite useful. And actually, it's worth noting that these fish, aquatic animals that usually live their whole lives in the water, will drown if they don't have access to air that they can breathe. But that's not where it ends with these guys. They have also been studied with regards to the development of tetrapod limbs. In particular, scientists were interested in studying phenotypic plasticity, which is the term used to describe the fact that some organisms will produce different phenotypes depending on their environment. I actually just had a discussion with this about my daughter the other day, as some water lettuce that we moved from my father's outdoor pond and put into our indoor aquariums has produced offspring whose leaves stay flat, as opposed to the normal upward curve shape of the parent plant. And while I don't know for certain if phenotypic plasticity is responsible for this, it served as the starting point for an educational discussion. Anywho, back to the monster dinosaur puppy fish, scientists hypothesized that phenotypic plasticity could have been responsible for some of the important changes that allowed stem tetrapods to move onto land, and they have been able to test this hypothesis through the Bashir. Some species of Bashir, notably the species that I am officially renaming the Falcor Bashir, are able to survive and walk on land. 
So scientists raised a group of them on land and compared their morphology and behavior with their aquatic cousins. The way they move has changed quite a bit when compared to the aquatically raised fish. The land-raised fish held themselves differently and moved their bodies in a different manner, giving them a more efficient gait on land. These differences were hypothesized to be learned training advantages, where it's simply a matter of a fish being raised on land having more practice moving itself on land than a fish raised in the water. But there were anatomical changes as well. The clavicle and clethrum, which are bones that connect the skull to the rest of the fish, were significantly different. The clavicles of the land-raised fish were narrower, with processes that were more pointed and 10% longer than the water-raised fish. The clavicle cross-section is thinner, and there was a reduction of size in the supraclethrum, which resulted in a weakened connection to the post-temporal bone and the clethrum, which allowed for greater flexibility of the head independently from the rest of the body. In other words, the beginnings of a neck. Some of the changes between the aquatic and terrestrial bashirs mirror the development that was seen in the fossil record of stem tetrapods of the Devonian period, suggesting that these changes were not only important for the development of the tetrapods, but can also happen quite rapidly, with significant change happening here in just one generation. So from studying the Bashir, we have found that phenotypic plasticity caused by environmental rather than genetic factors is a very important mechanism for large-scale evolution. It is important to note here that these changes were not genetic. They were likely related to different physical forces acting on their bodies, both from not being supported in the water and by using different muscle groups than their aquatic cousins. So we have phenotypic changes that are not the result of any changes to the genetics. So the physical features of the organism change in response to the environment, regardless of the genetics, making them more suitable for land-based operations. This means that a sudden drastic change in environment for an organism could very well be the starting point of that organism making the new environment its natural home, if it manages to survive the initial change. Next up is an animal whose omission from this list would get me piles of hate mail, the duck-billed platypus. These little weirdos are basically as close as you're ever going to get to the infamous crocoduck. They seem to be an animal that you would arrive at by hitting random on a character generator in a video game. And most of their features are primitive features that may have been shared by early mammals, but later evolved into different features. They are one of only two species of mammals today that lay external eggs, the other being the echidna. They start out life in leathery eggs that are incubated by the mother. When hatching, they make their way out of the egg with the aid of an egg tooth, a very reptilian feature. Interestingly, they start out life with a set of teeth while they're nursing in the nest and not eating anything that requires teeth, and then they shed these teeth shortly after leaving the nest when they start hunting their own food, as their specially adapted bills have a flat surface of hardened gum tissue that it uses to crush the shells of its prey rather than chewing on them with teeth. Aquatic monotremes likely developed from terrestrial monotremes, and the first platypusish monotreme showed up in the fossil record about 110 million years ago, about 70 million years after the first mammals showed up. The platypus is one of the most basal extant mammals, having diverged after the development of lactation, but before the full development of internal pregnancy. Monotremes are also literally named based on the fact that they use one hole for defecation, urination, and reproduction, the cloaca. That is a very reptilian feature for a mammal to have. And yes, echidnas and platypuses, platypi, platypodes, whatever their plural is, they have penises, but their penises are used solely for semen, not for urination. And insemination of the females takes place through the cloaca. Also, echidnas have penises with foreheads, just FYI. Back to the platypus, genome analysis suggests that the monotremes diverged from the rest of the mammals about 166 million years ago, just 12 million years after the mammals evolved in the first place. While nursing, the baby platypus will suck directly on the abdominal skin of the mother as the females lack nipples, showing the evolutionary path that lactation took, with milk just being a secretion from the skin initially rather than passing through ducts and nipples. The protein composition during lactation changes the same way it does in marsupials, but not in most other eutherians, that is, the branch of mammals that are not monotremes. Given that marsupials are more basal than the rest of the mammals, but less basal than the monotremes, it makes sense that these two groups would share some basal characteristics with each other. And the weird mashup between reptilian and mammalian characteristics in the monotremes can be observed on smaller scales as well. Their sperm are filiform, like bird and reptile sperm, but the chromosomes in the sperm are arranged in a defined order, like the rest of the mammals, but unlike birds. 
While the proteins that make up the sperm are mostly similar to those of other mammals, the epididymis, the tube in the body that transports the sperm, secretes a protein that is also secreted by the reptilian epididymis. Back to the chromosomes, if we examine the 52 chromosomes of the platypus, we find a mixture of reptilian and mammalian characteristics. The structure of the chromosomes is ranged in a very reptilian fashion, with just a couple of large chromosomes and lots and lots of small chromosomes, which in reptiles are referred to as macro and micro chromosomes. Their sex chromosomes are somewhat homologous to the bird's Z chromosome system for reproduction. In birds, the female rather than the male has the shortened chromosome, and the egg rather than the sperm determines the sex of the offspring. Though it is still unclear exactly how sex determination happens in the platypus. The platypus also has fewer than expected non-protein coding RNAs for a mammalian species, with their count being more similar to chickens than the other mammals. But when looking at coding DNA, it shares most of its commonalities with the other mammals. 82% of its genes were orthologs to genes in five other mammal species. But they also have conserved genes that have been retained in sauropsids, that is reptiles and birds, and other non-amniote vertebrates, but lost in the eutherian and marsupial mammals. So all the mammals except for the monotremes. Its eggs are a weird mix of sauropsid and marsupial characteristics. The eggs are much smaller relative to body size than those of birds and reptiles. They hatch early, so the embryo does most of its growing outside of the egg, relying on lactation, as in marsupials. But the zona pellucida, the membrane surrounding the egg before sperm implantation, has four proteins that are identical to human zona pellucida, but two that are otherwise unique to birds, amphibians, and fish. The aspartyl protease nothespin is a gene that exists in fish and sauropsids, which is thought to be involved in processing egg yolk proteins, and is completely absent in the rest of mammals. And of course, I would be remiss if I failed to mention the venomous spurs of the platypus. There are a handful of other mammals with venom, but the platypus is the only mammal which does not deliver its venom with a bite. And here's where things get interesting. While platypus venom is very similar in composition to several reptilian venoms, it is the result of convergent evolution. They developed the venom all on their own, they did not inherit it from their reptilian ancestry. One of the common arguments leveled against evolution is the idea that scientists are just trying to make everything fit in evolution, so if they see something similar, they'll declare it to have an evolutionary relationship. Not so with platypus venom. Now, I could keep going with the transitional, not quite reptilian, but not quite mammalian features on the platypus, like its immune system, genomic imprinting, repeat elements, the CPG fraction, the strangeness of its ability to electrically sense its underwater environment, and more, but suffice it to say for now that after not only a morphological analysis, but also a genetic analysis, we find that the platypus, while definitely fitting into the mammal category, is much closer to the sauropsids than the rest of the mammals, showing several features that are shared with the sauropsids. As far as transitional species go, it could be said that every living species is transitional. It is a transition between what came before it and what their lineage will eventually evolve into should they survive. But usually the word transitional is meant in a way that would have a species representing two distinct groups of animals. And I chose two examples that I thought fit the bill pretty closely. We have a fish that can drown in water and be raised completely terrestrially, and we have a mammal that lays eggs and whose eggs aren't quite the same as sauropsid eggs, but also aren't quite the same as mammalian eggs, with characteristics of both, and a bunch of other characteristics that have them both straddling the lines between their various categories. I could keep going with animals that have partially developed features, like mudskippers, a species of blenny fish that live at least part of their life on land, other blennies which have been known to climb trees and can spend the majority of their life out of water, labyrinth fish which have a breathing organ that is modified from the last pharyngeal arch or gill slit, lungfish which, like the Bashir, have pretty much fully developed lungs, climbing perch which can live for about 10 hours out of water, walking catfish, flying fish, flying squirrels, flying snakes. There are so many examples to choose from for a living transitional form, and if you want to get into the nitty gritty details, a case could be made for pretty much any living organism. The point is that one of the main arguments against the theory of evolution is a lack of transitional species, either in the fossil record or live today. With objections being raised, such as what good is half a lung or wing or eye? Well, we have living organisms today that essentially have half a lung, half a wing, and half an eye, so obviously they are at least a bit useful. 
Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, and What Jesus, who are the sturdy fins that allow the fish that is my channel to walk. If you'd like to keep me moving in an environment that I clearly wasn't made for, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!